On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Ellie, and Ellie was married to an abusive, intimidating addict. It's a story of generational trauma, an enabling family, infidelity, physical abuse, protecting your kids, and taking your power back. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Ellie. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you, Brandon? I am well. Thank you for asking. And if you want to be a guest on our show like Ellie is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that Guest Form, it takes you to our Guest Form page. And either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And with today's story with Ellie, there is a big content warning on this episode. We have graphic descriptions of physical abuse and child physical abuse as well. So a big content warning there. And today we are going to hear Ellie's story. It starts out with generational trauma, then abuse within a relationship, the relationship. And then it is about a mom who is doing anything and everything to protect her her kids. So a big thank you to Ellie for being here. This is our second recording doing this, and it's not easy to discuss your trauma once, but Ellie really wanted to help people. So really a big thank you here to Ellie for being here with us today. And now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Ellie, the floor is now yours. So I'll start at the beginning. Um, For the purposes of my sharing, I've cheated death many times. There's not really a good explanation of how that I'm able to sit here and share my story other than sheer will um, and faith. My battle with narcissism has been lifelong. It didn't start when I met the wrong partner. I had been primed from a very early age with two parents that just refused to heal. And because of that, my childhood was excessively dysfunctional. I survived abuse of all forms to such a severe degree that my brain refuses to allow me to remember even half of it. Through my healing journey, there have been many points where some of these acts do come up unprocessed, feeling like they're just begging for me to heal them. And in the beginning of that, I really suffered. Um, This has been some of the most painful work that I have ever been asked to do. Reflecting back on on my childhood, um, I'd like to start there. My mother was very emotionally abusive. She beat me up emotionally on the daily. Nothing was ever good enough. I grew up feeling like I was not good enough, and this created some pretty horrible self-talk. And when I think about it now, how I used to feel about myself and how I used to talk to myself, I cringe. I had friends, but I didn't feel worthy of these relationships. I was a good student. I maintained straight A's. I was a ballet dancer, um, and I was a perfectionist. I felt that if I was perfect, then maybe my mother would love me. And I craved her love. I wanted her to notice me. Later on, um, years later, I would try to gain a sense of control by starving myself. Um, And this made me feel powerful. I would over-exercise. I would do hundreds of crunches before any meal. And I would exercise hours into the evening and still felt like I needed to do more and more and more. I remember driving in the car with my mom once and 
I said to her, which was such a, a very hard thing to even say out loud, but I said, mom, I, I think that I'm anorexic. And she said, you're not skinny enough to be anorexic. At that point, uh, I was about 13, um, barely 90 pounds. I would struggle with self-worth until well after I barely survived my ex-husband. My father was an abusive alcoholic. He refused to do his own work, and he survived by bringing his children into his suffering with him. He would drink and drive with us. Um, we went for visitation for a few hours twice a week, and then every other weekend. And he was not able to be sober for that three and a half, four hour visit. He would drink and drive with us. And I remember being on the highway and he would just be going 90 plus and my knuckles would be gripping the, the inner car handle, um, just gripping it. And my knuckles would be white because I was just so afraid we were going so fast. And I was just, I was terrified. I was about six. It was the nineties. So, you know, no, no car seat at that point. I was sitting in the front and I could have easily been killed by by the airbag. Um, my five-year-old brother was in the back. And at that point, my little sister didn't, didn't go with him yet. Um, and he would look over at me and just laugh and say, what are you afraid of? Stop, stop gripping the door. Just laughing at me. It was just, it was horrible. Um, my mom knew how bad it was. She knew what was happening, but she was too afraid of him. And she was too unhealed to continue to fight for us. She, she divorced him. And, um, and following that, we just continued to go with him. And it was, it was terrifying. Um, I remember one night, I was around the same age, and he had low-income housing. And he was passed out on the floor, just cold. And I remember... I think I put my hand in front of his face. I, I wasn't sure um, if he was breathing and he was, and I don't know how I called her, but I called her on the phone. Um, I think I called the operator and told them my mom's name and that she worked at this hospital. How I knew that information, I don't know. I was six. Um, and she said on the phone, I finally got a hold of her and I told her what was going on. And, and she said to me, do you want me to come pick you up? And my brother's sobbing. He's five and I'm six. And it was one of those points where I, I just knew I was so alone. I'm making these adult decisions. And I remember saying, no, I guess not, or, you know, something like that. It's just absolutely unreal. On the weekends with my dad, um, I was the oldest. And so it was my responsibility to sit at the kitchen table with him. He would put my siblings to bed early, like 6.30, it's still light out. And I would sit at the table with him for six or seven hours. He would get drunker and drunker and drunker. And he would tell me all these things about Satan and devil talks and um, all of these kind of weird satanic riddles. And um, it was um, it was unreal when I wasn't having to sit at the table with him doing that. I was forced to go and bus tables um, with my stepmother from 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. And I would make about $18 and he would put it into an account where I had a bank account. Um, and he would later just take all of that money from the years of forcing me to do this and, um, and use it for, for his addictions. I didn't have a safe person. I grew up taking care of myself. I grew up taking care of my siblings. I had a brother that was a year and a half younger than me and then a sister that was seven years younger than me. So I grew up really taking care of my sister a lot. I always felt unsafe. I always felt shameful, very jumpy. When I needed to, I hid it. Um, I went to school and this was my reprieve. I loved school. I could learn. I could sit peacefully. And because I was a good student, I excelled. Um, I would carry school as a foundation for me, even still working on my doctorate. For me, in many ways, it's been a safety net. I dated a string of narcissists, each one 
was a little worse than the next, but all of them had similar qualities. They had really strange relationships with their mothers. Um, not, you know, not this healed, bonded kind of, you know, mother-son relationship. Very, very strange relationships. Um, they compared me. They degraded me constantly. Some of them were abusive, but all of them had hidden substance abuse issues that really weren't so hidden once they felt that it was time to unmask. And I have always had this thing where I feel like everyone is innately good. And that sometimes that goodness just needs to be coaxed out. And now I see that as naivety and purely a perception of them, my perception. Um, And I, you know, I, I saw what I wanted to see. And these men had no interest in healing. And if I wasn't going to ride that wave that they chose to be on, then I just better get out, get off it. There were a few kinder souls mixed in there, but subconsciously, and you know, I didn't know it at that point, but they were really boring to me. And I know that sounds twisted, but it's the truth of it. Well, it's not twisted. You came from chaos. And when you're coming from a very chaotic environment, chaos is what you're used to. Chaos is what is normal for you. And it's going to put you in harm's way more often than not. But when you're used to that, everything else seems boring. It's like if you're a fixer, of some sort, or if you're someone like that and you get into a relationship with someone who doesn't need any fixing, then that is a hard environment to be in because you're trying to possibly find things to fix. So it makes a lot of sense and it's not twisted. Um, But when it comes to this person that you were at this time and, and up to the point of before you meet your partner, that the story is about who would you say you are as a person? Like if the outside world saw you and said, you know, this is Ellie, she is X, 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 X. What would, what would you say? And then how did you want to be perceived? I would say, you know, at the beginning, you know, who I was, I, the best word I could use would be, I was alive. I loved to run. Um, I liked to do half marathons. I liked to do yoga, hot yoga, um, go and get like a, a fun eclectic meal. Um, I liked to just, I liked to be busy too. Um, you know, I was constantly going and doing something. I was, if it was the summer, it was always at the beach, just wicked beach bum. Um, I think that people would probably describe me just as, um, like, busy and alive and fun. I was just, that's who I was. And I was a nurse, um, which I also loved doing as well. Um, Really a passion. And it fed into, you know, caretaking. What I wanted more than anything was to be loved. And when I reflect back on what I was looking for at that point, and I don't even know It wasn't all conscious. A lot of it was subconscious. And, you know, what you had just said earlier about, you know, chaos is home. Yeah, absolutely. So I looked for that home everywhere and I looked for it in every single relationship. But I I wanted to be loved and I wanted somebody to be proud of me. Um, And, you know, I would learn years later through my healing journey, really, that I was also looking for that in myself. So eventually you end up meeting the person that this story is about. So take us from here. So I met my ex. Um, We were both working in an emergency room. This was an emergency room that was like my dream job. Um, I had worked in a smaller inner city ER. Um, and if ER nursing is your passion, you may be like me, I wanted to do trauma and critical care. So I had moved to this, to this other emergency room and I didn't work with my ex that frequently. I met him maybe a handful of times in this environment. Um, 
the way that he presented himself was just this kind of quiet, more reserved, competent provider. Um, and I immediately felt a pull towards him. Um, I don't really know that I can kind of put that into words, but in early on in meeting him, I felt like, oh my God, like I've met, you know, when we first started dating, I thought this is my soulmate. I've, I've met him. I've finally met the love of my life. Um, and he just seems to be quiet and just seemed different than men that I had previously dated who kind of had more, uh, overt characteristics, I guess I would say, um, or maybe a little bit louder. Um, so he just seemed different. And I had that just immediately, immediate pull to him. I wanted to be viewed as, I think exactly as I, you know, described him because this was all just this mask. It was just this kind of work mask. It was this quiet, competent, um, very tall. Um, I found him attractive, um, just kind of carried like that air of that. Um, I only worked with him a handful of times and then he ended up moving closer to um, where he had grown up um, a couple hours away. And that's kind of when we started dating it initially was, was a longer, longer distance, but um, gave a very, very different picture of who he was um, initially and within the work environment. Um, for me, it felt like home. And I would later be told in therapy that in an unhealed state, if it feels like home, you better hightail it out of there because that home is exactly what you've experienced throughout your childhood, throughout your life. Um, and I subconsciously pulled all of that back in repeating what had already been a malicious cycle that I had barely gotten out of. Um, in the beginning, he mirrored all of my likes back to me. You know, like I said, I was an avid runner, yoga, um, outdoors as much as possible, concerts. Like I was doing all of these things and he, he pretended like those were his likes as well. I mean, he would go running for me and he running with me and he would be winded but not so much winded that I wouldn't think that he you know ran some um but yeah everything that that I did became the things that he also did um and you know reflecting back on it initially I thought wow I've I've selected my ex-husband based on everything with my father um abusive and alcoholic in denial but really delving into it I realized that connection was much more akin to my mother, manipulative, coercive, um, vindictive. Um, And if I didn't succumb to what was being said or instructed of me, um, then I was going to be punished. And I realized how much I had been emotionally and mentally, mentally tortured in my childhood and how this primed the stage for the relationships that I would seek out. For me, um, you know, the red flags were muted. And when I say that I was primed for this relationship, I mean, my ability to navigate my intuition had been stomped out of me in childhood. I had no sense of what a healthy relationship was. I knew how to be a caretaker. Um, I loved being a nurse, but it is the role of a caretaker. And innately that's always what what felt right to me so when I saw naked women and active messaging on his computer that flashed up on me you know this is fast forwarding a little bit um but I'm you know sitting on the computer trying to apply for a job closer to where he lives and all of this stuff pops up um and I was just I was sick and I remember sitting in this chair in his living room and he's making direct eye contact with me and he's telling me there's nothing to worry about, you know, all of these things. And I remember feeling sick and I was just sobbing, but I chose to just, I chose to believe him. Um, the next day, I was not allowed to use his computer at all. A few weeks later, 
I had spontaneously moved in with him, which was not my typical. Um, I, I wasn't spontaneous like that. That was not my typical move, but, but it happened. What was the catalyst to get you to do that? You know, it was about two and a half hours um, between us. And, you know, every time that I would go up to, to meet him, we would go out and have like a fun, eclectic meal. We'd go running in the morning, um, go and have like, like a cool breakfast. Um, he lived in this very cool area um, that kind of mirrored one of my favorite places from um, where I was from. And so it just felt really special and it felt, um, it felt different. And I was so excited every time I drove up and I was like, wow, this is just like a, a different kind of place. Like that would be cool to live here. And then it just all kind of like, it was like a whirlwind. It just happened so quick. It was kind of maybe, it was kind of, like you're driving up there and it's like the yellow brick road and you see Oz in the Emerald City, kind of. Yeah. Like a yeah. real, you know, there's, it's so, you're so focused on that thing and the feeling that you're getting while seeing it or visualizing it is instilling in you or in getting ingrained in you every single time you're going that it starts to, you get, as you said earlier, you said the word home, you know, you're mm-hmm. getting this good feeling that this could be home you know, that starts to get into you until you find out that, you know, behind that sheet, the wizard really isn't a wizard. Well, right. I was, as you were saying that, I was just thinking, wow, yeah. And what a great comparison because truly he is the wizard, right? He's just the man behind the curtain. Um, but yeah, don't know that at that point. Um, and it was much different what, once I moved up there. Um, I had barely settled all of my bags my first evening there and he's like all right bye I'm going out and I was like okay great let's go like what are we doing and he's like oh no you're not coming um I don't know anyone I literally I'm I'm alone in his apartment um in this downtown area and okay all right see you later and I was like wait a minute I'm sorry what I've been here for you know 0.2 seconds um and he went out and he just got super drunk and it literally just felt like getting punched in the gut honestly when he came home he fell asleep on the couch and just peed all over himself that was the extent of you know a lot of the drinking that would carry through he would be at that level where he would just pee all over himself and a few days later I found out that we were having a baby and now this was something that he used as an excuse for raging with alcohol, Um, at least, you know, with his family um, that that circled around him and enabled the drinking, they wanted me to have an abortion. And for me, I chose that that was not the option for me. And he started to play the card of she's trapping me, but I didn't know that because that's not what was being said to me. But I think back on it now and you know, the amount of masking that he did and with what seems like so much ease, it wasn't something that he had to even think about. It's just something that happened. He just did it. He was a completely different person around his family. His mother would later say to me, sit in your ma- sit in your box and shut your mouth. Um, and his father would say, he's just blowing off steam. And this was when I was talking about what was happening with the alcohol and it was getting significantly out of control and I was asking for their help. But, you know, in thinking about that, this wasn't any different than what had been going on before. This is the behavior that they had always enabled. This was the level of drinking that they had always enabled. I just didn't know that because I didn't see it. I was hours away. Um, The, you know, visual that I had seen at work was completely different. You know, it was just all of these different masks that I had observed. This wasn't any different. He had been doing this for almost 40 years. Um, So they didn't have an interest in this conversation. I was supposed to just sit there and keep my mouth shut. And this was a lot like my childhood, sit there and shut up. Um, 
my father had once said to me, you're going to go far in life because you're quiet and pretty. And so, you know, as a little girl being told these things, and I didn't feel any of those things. I was quiet because I was full of shame and guilt. I didn't think I was pretty. I didn't think any of those things because my self-worth was so shot. But I had learned early on that my role as a little girl and my role growing up in this world was to be something to be looked at and to be something that is quiet. Um, and I say something because I wasn't viewed as a person by him. So that's what I had learned. So here I am. My childhood and my adult life are now enmeshed. They're tangled. And I felt like I was being strangled. So very early on here, you are away from your home. You're away from your friends. You're living with this person. You are now about to have a child with this person. And you under you're starting to get a picture of who they are more than they were presenting when you worked with them in another town. You're seeing this family and this family is not the best. You came from your version of trauma in your family and his is different. Um, in the sense of this family is still intact and uh, together and they are running their own little games and they're an enabling family and they're a protective family of the people that are inside it. So you getting help from them is going to be non-existent and they're going to be actively part of the abuse. So I guess tell us more about the inner workings of uh, this enabling family in understanding, you know, who your partner is and how I guess everything inside functions. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, at this point, I'm isolated. Um, I'm overwhelmed with the fact that now I am carrying a child. Um, in this environment, I have no idea about anything to do with this family because when I had initially met them, it, you know, obviously they're not like, Hey, here's all of our qualities and, and here's who we really are. There's all of this masking going on. And so I'm not seeing my friends. Um, I was pretty sick, um, during my pregnancy and now we're hours away. I'm also not really in contact with my family because I had broken out of that family um, out of necessity to maintain my mental health. So, so here I am um, and I'll talk about, yeah, his family involvement. So the relationship that he had with his mother um, was very strange. He was essentially his wife. She was part of every single move, our marriage was not our marriage um, once we were married. But even, you know, the, the basic relationship was not. She was always a part of, of everything. And again, I didn't, I didn't know how much of it. It, it kind of um, presented itself in varying degrees. But they were constantly talking about every single aspect of what was going on within our relationship. They had more conversations about our relationship than my ex-husband and I had about our relationship. Um, I didn't have a say in anything that was happening in our lives. So I was just, I was filling a role that made him look put together and balanced. But he also had a similar relationship with his brother's wife, um, who would join in with him and picking on me. He didn't have a problem with making fun of me or picking at me and then calling me too sensitive or too emotional. And so he wouldn't do this out in public. In public, it was completely different. But he felt completely comfortable doing it in front of his family. Um, and it kind of, you know, escalated and escalated and escalated. It wasn't, um, it was more subtle in the beginning. And it just kind of went from there. Um, so it was at his parents' house. And then, you know, I'll talk about it, but at, our, our house, 
behind closed doors was was the worst of it. But here within his family dynamic, um, his sister-in-law just really enjoyed joining in. They would have this like sinister grin when they did it and they enjoyed picking on me. Um, that was very clear. They'd get off on it, that they could do it tandemly. And so I became the, scape- the scapegoat in that family system. Um, and this was much like my family of origin system. And then, this, you know, the thing about me is that at a certain point, I speak up, but they hated when I spoke up and how dare I demand respect because in their minds, a punching bag didn't deserve respect. And, and, you know, thinking about it, they don't care if it's a positive reaction or a negative reaction, you're giving something, then they're going to keep doing it because you're reacting. It's kind of like a cat. Um, with a mouse, like batting it around. It doesn't care. Are you going to squeal? Are you just going to move? Are you going to play dead? It do- they don't care. Um, so I was kind of fueling that a little bit just with kind of standing up for myself too. He'd start smearing my name um, very early on. It was this start of character assassination, um, prepping for when I would leave, which was his deepest fear of abandonment. And his family joined in. And he would, you know, make a comment about something that was a sensitive topic for me. Like once I had, when I was pregnant um, with my first son and, you know, when he was born and all these things, I would try to have my mom come back into my life. Um, And that was really hard for me, but I had this guilt, right? I wanted to be able to, I didn't want to keep their grandmother from them if she wanted to have some sort of relationship with them. And so he would make a comment. I remember, you know, sitting in the, on the couch and he smirked. Um, and it's that very, if you've seen this, this smirk, you, you know what it is. Um, he was enjoying this and he just says, her mother's coming this weekend. And my sister-in-law at the time smiled and she just joined in and they were just asking me all of these questions. And I just said, you know, I just like really don't want to talk about this. And I was just trying to hold back tears because it just felt like they're just going to continue to pick on me. And it was just such a, such a painful thing to talk about. And I didn't want to, and I was feeling all sorts, all sorts of anxious and just upset, um, just about the fact that she was coming. Um, so it was, it was just really, it was really cruel, honestly. They just got off on being cruel. My ex-husband was also having sex with my sister-in-law, unbeknownst to me at that point. But the level of disgusting that this man offered went beyond any disturbed human that I have ever met. Um, but I was supposed to mind my business in that family system. And he was supposed to be able to operate however he wanted to operate. And it had always been supported. Um, I remember, you know, saying to him that I wasn't feeling supported and that I didn't feel heard because I did try to have conversations with him and they were circular. They would be these circular conversations or it would be, oh, you're just so emotional. Oh, you're just so sensitive. You know, oh, you know, you're crazy. You need mood stabilizers, all of these things. Um, And it would always just kind of go in a circle. There was never resolution with it. And he just said to me, you know, I've known them longer, so I'm going to agree with them no matter what. And that was just supposed to be that, you know, I I was talking to him about his sister-in-law and how she was acting towards me. And, and that was, that was the response. Um, She started to treat me worse and worse. His brother, uh, my ex-husband's brother was the only one in the family that reached out and tried to make um, time for his boys and mine go out on a walk or do some sort of like other kind of outing if schedules aligned. But my sister-in-law at the time wasn't on board with this. She would take the car seats with her to work. So he wasn't able to leave. Um, And this was all within like a very close vicinity. We lived two houses down from his parents. And then his brother and sister-in-law lived right down a private road from our house at that point. So we were all in very close Um, vicinity. I'm in this family system structure where I'm viewed as an outsider and it's 
so significantly worse than the narcissistic family structure that I grew up in. And I'm just like, oh my God, now here I am. And I'm the primary target for all of them here. Um, and in these moments, I realized how much she hated me too. And I didn't know why at that point, something felt really weird in the dynamic that she had with my husband or you know, ex-husband, but I, you know, I couldn't put my finger on it. And I'm also dealing with all of my own, um, you know, feelings about everything that's going on. And I knew that, as, you know, as much as, as it's a choice, these people were acting this way with intention um, and they were they were enjoying it. And that was very clear to me. My brother-in-law stopped reaching out. Um, he wasn't allowed to reach out anymore. He wasn't allowed to spend time with my boys and I, but she was allowed to be at, at my home. Um, I worked pretty infrequently um, at that point. Um, I would become more of a stay-at-home mom and I was finishing my master's and, and all of this. So I did have some clinical days and she would be at my house. Like she's, you know, in my space, but I am not allowed to be over there. I'm not allowed to see my nephews. Their family dinner dinners circled around when I wasn't going to be present. So they they started isolating me because I chose to talk about what was going on. So with your story, once the first big escalation point happens, it opens up the floodgates for more. So walk us through this. Yeah, um, you know, the abuse was pretty subtle, um, coercive in the beginning, um, but not to the degree that it escalated to until we got married. Um, at that point, it was it was like a rubber band just snapping back. It was night and day. Um, within two days of marrying him, he no longer wore the mask. He hung up his mask on the wall when he was home. It was like, I don't need this anymore. Um and it, it just all, it just all hung out and it was really scary. So it went from, yeah, I know I have a problem. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to cut down to, I never said that. I don't have a problem. I never did that. You're remembering it wrong. You're delusional. You live in a different reality. He started telling me every single day, you live in a different reality. Um, and I did. I lived in a different reality. I didn't live in his deluded reality. Um, but when you're being told that every single day, a part of you starts to question whether it's true. And at this point, he's a professional alcoholic. And there were a lot of drugs, too. But I wouldn't know that until far into an affair that he was having um, with a woman that he worked with, one of the nurses. And this started while I was pregnant with our first son. So this affair started way back. It started before we got married. Um, it started very early on in our relationship. And it, she wasn't the only woman, but it was just the woman that he kind of stuck with, you know, another kind of source of supply. Something fell off. But again, my intuition was stomped out. So I didn't trust it. I didn't trust myself. I couldn't put my finger on what was actually going on. Um, you know, he's not coming to me and saying, I'm cheating on you, but I did have this innate fear that he was going to cheat. Um, and that feeling was actually my intuition telling me that it was, but again, I stomped out. So there were, there came a night where this fear was cemented. He'd come home from a golf tournament, blackout. He couldn't even walk or talk. And he would, this is a state that he would constantly drive in. So this night, I'm taking his keys and his phone out of his pocket so he didn't pee on them. And up pops a message from this woman. So I'm seven months pregnant with our second son. And it's another gut punch for me. And I'm also so angry um, and so many other things. But, you know, I had stood by him. I'd supported him. I had asked him to stop drinking. You know, I'm, I'm standing there and I'm just like, okay, I'm carrying our second son. Um, I'm dealing with all of this behavior because I want to be able to provide my kids with a stable home, which I wouldn't call what that was a stable home. But in my mind at that point, you know, I'm, I'm still in it and I'm trying to make everything work and I'm trying to just do everything possible 
that I can do. And in that moment, I'm feeling like, why isn't this enough for him? The night that I found out, I confronted him. I mean, there was no way I was going to sleep that night. So we're talking like into the wee hours of the morning um, because he was peeing on himself on the couch. So, I, you know, I confront him later and he was so enraged. I think just because I knew what was going on and he chased me up the stairs. Um, our bedrooms were upstairs and I locked the bedroom door and he broke it down, just clear off the hinges, just ripped the door down. And I just, I laid down on the bed and I knew I just had to protect my belly. So I was kind of on my, I was on my left side and I just had my hands up over my head and he's just punching and punching and punching. And he's so just angry. And I'm literally just a lot of the punches just went over my head. Um, I was able to shield my belly Um, going through everything that I've been through already in that space. Um, what's wrong with me is, is how I'm feeling. What did I do wrong? Like, what is this? And I, I just, I was so confused and I was so alone. Um, and I drove down to, um, again, his, you know, family lived very close, just a few houses down. So I had a conversation with his sister-in-law and at that point she became equally upset but it wasn't for me. She had just these massive tears. And I remember just feeling like this is obviously like, these emotions are not for me. Like something feels really weird here, but she was upset for herself because they were sleeping together and it was okay for her to sleep with him and, you know, cheat on me, but how dare he cheat on her? Um, it was just this insane, um, insane situation on top of an already insane situation you know they would sexually text all the time so it's just it was indescribable um she told me you can't you can't go back to where you had lived you know you know prior to coming here because they were that point you know my son's support and in that moment part of me believed that part of me Maybe all of me believed it. I just felt even more trapped at that point because I was like, oh, my gosh, am I going to take my son, um, you know, away away from his support system? Um, oh, I'm his support system. And, you know, healthy parents and, and people are their support systems. But in that space, I'm thinking, oh, my God, she's right. Like, here I am. So now this family system is further gaslighting me. They're bullying me into staying there. I'm even more isolated. I'm even more alone. And I'm spiraling because the abuse is increasing. And I just felt like I'm just, I'm going to implode. I spent my days shielding my three-year-old from this and just trying to focus on growing my second son. Um, And thinking about this, you know, it's, it's like a palpable space, you know, talking about this, like I can, I can feel that pain um, process through a lot of it, but you know, in that space, his family rallied. I remember his mom said to me, he came here and he looked sorry. And at that point, I'm sitting on the couch holding um, my pregnant and swollen belly and chasing my three-year-old around and just feeling like my world is ending. So when that happens, how are you feeling like during the event, right after the event? And then do you feel differently um, once the mom comes over and does this kind of smoothing over or, or reinforcing maybe what he might've said, um, are there two different, like a uh, feelings kind of going on? I know you said here that you felt like your world is ending, but how are you uh, justifying things or, uh, how are you trying to keep yourself safe and your kids safe uh, mentally? Yeah, I feel like when I was just describing that, I felt like I was, it's one of those memories that I will always have that palpable sensation where I feel like I'm back in it, not completely, but I had to kind of, I think I had to just stop talking about it for a minute. Um, 
it was terrifying. I, my three-year-old son is in the bedroom right next door. It's kind of adjoined and he didn't wake up. I don't know how he had, you know, white noise machine on and I think the air conditioner, I can't remember at that point, but loud enough where he didn't wake up. And, um, I, I just thought I was going to die in that moment. And I knew, okay, I've got to protect this little one that's in my belly and maybe I am going to die here. I don't know. Um, and the weird part about it was that the fire alarm system went off. And so then my son was awake, but this is after. And I, it was like this, like, I feel like sometimes there are these, you know, moments in time where, where something happens and maybe that's kind of what saved me in that space because the alarm wouldn't stop going off. So he was distracted by that. He goes and turns off the alarm and it goes off again. And we had hardwired um, alarm system and it just kept going off to the point where the fire department had to come. And I think one of like the craziest points of that is that then we have the fire department there. There's help there. But in that space, I have been bred and, um, and gaslit into thinking it's not as bad as what I think is going on, that maybe I am crazy, that I live in a different reality, and that nobody is going to believe me if I try and speak up. So I don't even say anything. I don't say anything. And, and they come and they do a check throughout the house. They go up into the attic space and, you know, I, I, and I remember too, I brought my three-year-old over to see one of the fire trucks and I'm just alone with one of the firefighters. And there's a part of me, I wish I had just said something at that point, but again, because of everything that I just said, I, I didn't say anything. It was terrifying. It was one of those moments in, in time where you're like, I survived that piece. It's not even just this whole big experience. Like I survived that night. There's a huge level of dissociation um, and numbness. It's just, you know, that almost primal kind of, here you go. Like, we're just gonna, we've got to get through this. And so we're just gonna kind of make you go numb. And and here it is. And it, it is surreal. And the other piece of it is the safety part. I mean, would they have even taken him? Um, at that point, he's calm. So if they didn't, if they didn't take them, take him, and also, again, like, are they going to think I'm crazy? Like, I have been gaslit into all of these different feelings. I don't even know what feelings are mine and what feelings are his superimposed, you know, um, into into what I'm thinking. But what if they don't take him? And then it's significantly worse. I mean, what if he does then kill me that night? Like I, there's just all of this multitude of different things that's, you know, going through my brain, but mostly fear and numbness in that experience. So eventually you had physical manifestations of the anxiety, which was caused by the abuse. So tell us about this. Um, you know, with him, a decade with him, I would have this, physical chest pain. Um, this just like riddled with, with physical feeling of anxiety. And that's not something that I had experienced before. Um, that was, was just with him. I felt like it actually would ache. Like it would actually just hurt. And I felt like my chest was just going to explode. Um, you know, I, I was constantly worried. I was worried he was going to drive into a tree. I was worried that then my kids wouldn't have a father and I was worried that he was with other women, you know, and I remember talking about this, um, in therapy and the therapist was like, well, that's also emotional abuse. But, you know, when you're, when you're in it, you're just like, well, this is just part of the relationship, right? Like, and I have all of these constant, but I was so anxious. I was just a mess. I was a mess all the time a mess if he pulled into the driveway I'm just like oh my god like who's gonna walk through the door right now I don't even know like did I do all of this properly like I did all of this you know like oh my god like we're doing takeout tonight like that would just infuriate him but 
So I'm trying to manage all of these different things. And I just, I was burning out. I was just burning out on every single level. And it was a double-edged sword because when he was home, that anxiety was heightened. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know when his next insult was going to come. The next thing I didn't do properly, the next time he was going to berate me. Um, and then once I found out about the affair, that's when the physical abuse, you know, really started. It was, it was kind of like that. I don't want to call it like a, a hallmark event, but kind of, I suppose, where when he broke down the door, the experience that I just talked about, that was really like the, the crux of like, all right, here's here's the physical abuse. And it just rapidly escalated. He started slamming me into walls. Um, One thing he would do constantly, he'd block the doorway so I couldn't leave the house. So I would walk to the front door and he'd block the doorway. And so I'd try to walk around to the back door and he'd block the doorway and he'd laugh in my face. And then he'd just call me a stupid bitch. Um, And he'd do all of this in front of the kids too. So they're witnessing all of this. And this is when, you know, this is like kind of the onset of like the daily, you need mood stabilizers. You're crazy. You're too emotional. Just like all of this. So once the physical abuse happens, intimidation becomes a huge tactic. So walk us through this. So my ex-husband's favorite tactic was intimidation. He got off on watching me cringe back in fear. He would, this was something that happened a lot. He'd raise his fist up um, and he'd draw it back and he would punch into my face. He wouldn't make direct contact. So he'd be looking at me just square and he would just bring it just like an inch from my nose or an inch from my eye. And he'd just laugh in my face and he'd say, I know you're afraid of me. Um, and I would just jump back, right. I would flinch. And that was the part that he liked. It made him feel powerful. Um, sometimes I would say, no, I'm not, but mostly it just really wore me down and just broke me down. And I was afraid. I mean, I was terrified and he knew it. He started to regularly threaten to kill me. He had two guns. And he got off on showing me just how easy it would be to kill me. When I was leaving, he pinned me against the wall and he told me, if you try to leave me, I will break every bone in your body. And I knew at that point I was either going to die or get my boys out of there. And if not, and I stayed, they were going to watch me die there. And I had stayed because I couldn't imagine leaving them with him unsupervised. I mean, he was passing out all over the place. I didn't want them to be in that environment unsupervised on top of of all of the abuse. But it came to a point where I didn't have an option. At this point, you know, I'm I'm fully isolated from his family because I'm viewed as viewed as a problem um, for asking for help. You know, I'm I'm married to him, so now I'm considered to be, you know, this is this is what I signed up to endure. And I'm essentially an appendage to him. That's that's it. And I became less and less myself. I was just I was broken down. Um I attempted to see a therapist. And one of the biggest errors for me with that thought thought process was that, you know, I'm still trying to fix him. I'm trying to fix this, I'm trying to fix him. And he didn't have any intention of helping himself. And he didn't have any interest in treating me any different than how he was treating me. So I'm seeking out all of these resources and just, you know, fervently trying to, to fix this. And it, it cannot be fixed. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And he's in active denial. And I'm triggering that. So it's making that situation even more dangerous in, you know, every single form. So it's escalating rapidly. So eventually you get to the point where you know you have to leave. So walk us through these events. So when I decided to leave, it followed some of the worst acts of cruelty. Um, And such a jump 
in the level of escalation that it was either leave now or the boys are, are going to watch me die. And at this point, they are three and one and um, they're very little. I knew he wanted to kill me and that there was intention there. And I was dangerous to him because I was not going to go along with submission. I told him I was filing for divorce, that I couldn't do this any longer. He, you know, at first told me, oh, you don't need a lawyer, work it out, and hired one of the most aggressive bullies imaginable. Um, It was him in lawyer form, which I didn't know at that point, you know, as he's telling me, you don't need a lawyer. Now he had a new kind of weapon and one that yielded power within the legal system. Remember, he looked at me and just said, good, this will just help everything that I've been saying about you and how crazy you are. He would make these kind of small admissions to things that he was doing. And again, I didn't realize it at that point what he was saying to me, but he was telling me, this is what I've I've been saying this about you for so long, and I'm admitting that to you. But I knew I had tried every possible avenue I could to help him. And it was more than, than what was deserved. But, you know, in that time and space, I believed I could help him, that I could fix it and that he could be healthy and happy. And at this point, I realized that's not an option and it became more and more clear. And he threatened to kill me again. His hands were on my neck and my back was against the wall. And um, he meant it. He meant it now. He chased me in his car at this point, demanding that I pull over. So I called the police. I went to the police station and I was at that point finalizing a protective order. And the police, they weren't helpful. They wanted to see physical evidence. They asked, where are your bruises? Where are your broken bones? They couldn't see all of the scars inside. They couldn't see what was going on the inside. They couldn't understand domestic abuse that didn't show in the form of my face all bloody and swollen. That's, you know, and I'm not saying that that's what they wanted to see, but that's kind of the the evidence that they were seeking at that point. The following few weeks were a blur. A blur. Um, I filed for divorce. I filed for a restraining order. I moved the boys um, into one of my friend's homes and we stayed in her child's room. Um, And he moved into their bedroom. We were there for about a month and a half waiting for a house that I was going to rent to be prepared. Um, At this point, there were a couple people that knew some things that were happening because it escalated so severely. And I had to get out of there so quickly and rapidly um, that a couple of the nurses that I was friends with knew and one of the doctors one of the doctors said to me, you're going to die in there. Um, and I said, I don't, I don't know how to get out. I I can't, I don't have money. Like I don't, I don't know the first thing about getting out of here. And, um, but I know I have to. And she literally said, I'm giving you $4,000. Here's first month in security. There's enough in there for a moving truck. You're getting out and you're doing it now. You're filing for that restraining order. And that was that. She said, I'm going to wake up one morning and it's going to be a picture of you in the paper that you've been murdered in that house. So the landlords that we were going to rent from, my boys and I, they were between us and another couple. And I wrote them a letter, essentially just explaining what was going on. Um, I explained that we were leaving a really abusive relationship that we needed to get out and just said, you know, I'm a, a very, I'm quiet, I do yoga, I run, like I, it's just my boys and I, please. Um, this is a, a space that's about 45 minutes from him. So there needed to be a little bit of, of space as well. Um, it was about as far as I was able to move. And they ended up taking us, been here for five years. They've been so good to us. They said, what's the make and model of his car? What's his license plate? And they have watched for him since, you know, even since car changes. Um, Remember one of my friends had the same car and they came out and they literally patrolled just to see who was getting out of the car, 
and I said, you know, this is, you know, so-and-so, but they, they've been so amazing. But at this point, you know, I didn't know how I was going to pay my bills. I didn't know how I was going to feed my children. Um, for a long time, you know, I would get a little bit of fruit. And I would get a loaf of bread and eggs and I would make egg drop toast. And my kids were little, you know, they would eat the same thing all the time because that's what they would have done regardless. Um, and that's what, what they ate. And I would not eat for days. Um, I was still a per diem, um, ER nurse, but at this point I was finishing out my clinicals for the nurse practitioner program. And because of that, Clinicals, you work for free. So um, there was no financial income at all. So at this point, you know, I'm cashing in change and I'm selling things, whatever I could possibly sell. I sold, um, you know, belongings, clothing, shoes, um, whatever it was that I could sell, I sold to feed my kids and pay rent. So eventually you started the uh, divorce process and, you know, court and everything like that and legal abuse comes into play. So walk us through this. You know, leaving all of that and surviving what I survived throughout that relationship and then throughout that marriage and getting out, I thought, okay, this is, this is the step where like, it's going to, improve. It's going to get better. I'm going to come out. I'm going to come into the court system and they're going to hear me. They're going to hear what's been going on. They're going to hear about everything that happened, how unsafe it was for the boys, how unsafe it was for me. And, um, and, you know, we're going to move forward. And I, in that place, couldn't have been more wrong coming into the family court system, because now I walked into a different kind of abuse and I walked into a system that I don't want to say that they can't or couldn't hear me, but they chose not to. It was like um, walking into a room and everybody is deaf um, to what's going on. So this piece was was the beginning of legal abuse. So he filed for an emergency hearing and I was dragged to court within a few days of filing the restraining order. When I went for the protection from abuse hearing for the restraining order, I was offered a restraining order, but not for the children. So this was my first introduction to this deafness of the court system to domestic abuse that isn't physical. He used all of the cards that I had written to him in the marriage. Um, I've always been a card person. So I, and that's just what I do. So I had written, you know, like a birthday card or or whatever it is. They, he and his lawyer entitled them love letters. And they used it as an exhibit to demonstrate what a loving husband and father he had been. But at this point, I realized that his parental rights superseded any rights that the children had to protection in that court setting. And they were being divided just like furniture. They were forced to go back into this very unsafe environment um, just because he was a father. So in our most vulnerable states, just barely getting out of there alive, this is the point where my worst nightmare began. And I thought what everything that I had endured was my worst nightmare and that I had left that and checked out and, you know, that chapter was over. And again, I couldn't have been more wrong at that point. So now they're going to be going with him unsupervised at this point. He had barely been able to get up the stairs most nights, passing out drunk in front of a crib, peeing on himself on the living room couch. He went into the bathroom once and... He, he didn't know where the toilet was. So he's peeing all over the changing table and it it sounded like a fountain. I was like, what in the world is going on? And I went in and he's just peeing all over the change. There's just pee everywhere. You know, I had stayed to protect them. And now I felt I'm coming into the system. Did I just choose to do the opposite? Should I have stayed there? All of these things are going through my, 
my mind at that point. And I'm like, I'm panicking. The other side of that is I knew I wouldn't have made it out of it alive. And so, you know, the way that I felt in these moments, there are no words. I can't describe it. I'll never be able to. He used the legal system and this aggressive lawyer to re-traumatize me. Um, I filed a total of three protection from abuse orders. In one of them, he listed my mother as a witness for him. I didn't realize this, but you can literally, you could write down 100 people on there. It doesn't matter. Um, They just, you can list whomever. So this hadn't been something that she had consented to. This was a fear tactic. He just wrote her down fully aware that she was dying of COVID at this point. She had been diagnosed with COVID. She um, was very ill and she had been intubated. So, and, and this is all going on at the time of this protection from abuse. And remember, his lawyer looked over at me as he was saying, Your Honor, one of the witnesses uh, won't be able to be here because of COVID precautions. And he looked over at me and just smiled. And it was right before I was going to get up and testify. Um, this is the point, too, where, um, you know, my mother is is dying. And seven weeks later, my father dies. Um, and he committed suicide. And so I'm crumbling. And he is aware of this. He is acutely aware of this. He knows that I am now even more vulnerable than, you know, than typical, right? And he just buckled down and he tried to create as much chaos as he possibly could. As I'm dealing with these unthinkable traumas, I'm dealing with the death of the deaths of two abusers going through this process where I'm speaking out against one of my abusers, trying to protect my kids and feel like I'm unraveling. So he just kept kicking me while I'm down, kicking me while I'm down. And I kept getting up. But I felt like this marionette being pulled this way and that way. And I'm struggling to keep my head above water. And I, you know, I, it felt like he literally was just stomping down on my head. Just like, why don't you just drown now? Why don't you just go back under there? And there were a lot of points throughout the course of this where I didn't think I was going to make it out. I laid down on the floor many times and I didn't know how I was going to get back up. And there were some really, really dark moments for me. Um, But I knew that if I didn't get back up, then my children weren't going to be protected. And I had taken them out of that environment to give them a peaceful, healthy, protected life. And I was going to keep fighting for them. And so in those moments where I didn't have any other reason to get up where maybe I wouldn't have just gotten up for myself. I got up for them. And so I put a brave face on and I, and I kept fighting. So eventually the divorce happens and then you begin to endure post-separation abuse. So walk us through this. So the post-separation abuse, I mean, I feel like, you know, I I get through all of these different experiences and now I'm in post-separation. And this by far is even worse. Like, I I can't even believe that there is something that, that could be worse than what I had just survived. But now he's weaponizing the kids. So now he has the kids to manipulate and coerce and train, and they have young, malleable minds, right? And they, they love their parents, you know, kids just innately love their parents. So now he's going to do all of the same things on the kids. And for me, this was the worst possible kind of pain that, that I could experience as a mother. There's nothing worse than this. And on top of that, you know, he's he's doing anything and everything that he possibly can to um, make the situation harder. So he's keeping all of the clothing that I send. 
He's um, sending them home in tattered clothing. He's sending them home dirty. He doesn't do, you know, just basic kind of care for the kids. He's not, he's not doing those things. My eldest comes home and, and he's had five black eyes in a three month period. They're coming home bruised. They're coming home with all of these different injuries. Um, my little guy came home with grav marks all over his arms. And I asked about it and, and he says, and they're big grab marks. And he says, oh, those must be from his cousin, um, who's two at that point. Like they're obviously it's not. And um, my oldest son says, dad put him down in a hard timeout. Like, what does that mean? He slammed him on the stairs. Okay. So, you know, there's all of these things happening. And I, I testified three times about what's happening in these protection from abuse hearings and the courts didn't hear enough of what they were looking for. And in the state that I lived in, I'm not able to give statements that the boys were saying because that's considered hearsay. So I'm only allowed to kind of describe what it is that I'm seeing. So you're so limited in the information that you're able to, to give. There were pediatrician reports of documented injuries consistent with abuse. It got to a point where I filed a police report when my youngest came home again with just these huge grab marks all over his arm. And he was big enough at this point. He's four. So he told me what happened. And he told me daddy had held him down and was sitting on him and he couldn't get out. And he was trying to bite him because he couldn't breathe. And my six-year-old recounted the same exact happenings. So I called the police station, um, in the town where I live that night, I had gotten the boys to bed first. And I said, this is what's going on. And they said, well, the boys are safe right now. This wouldn't be our jurisdiction. It has to be where it happened. Um, we're going to call them and let them know. And then they'll contact you in the morning. But you need to file a protection from abuse order. And I said, you know what? I don't want to file a protection from abuse order. And here's why. It's never enough. And what happens is it's like striking a hornet's nest. And it just makes everything a thousand times worse. And so they said, you really, you have to, you have to file a protection from abuse. Um, and you need to do that in the morning. So I go and do that. I get all of that settled. And then I hear from the detective from the town where he lives. And he says, I need you to come down and tell me everything that happened. So I recount everything that happened. And he just looks me dead in the eye. And it was the first time where I felt like somebody in the legal system heard me. He said, I will do everything in my power to help you. It was this, I, I find myself lacking words a lot as I'm kind of recounting, whether it's, you know, how it felt, because there just don't seem to be strong enough words of how it felt. I don't know how to describe what it felt like, because I was heard by this man and, and he was going to help. And he said, I know your ex. He smashed into a tree drunk a ways back and I tracked him down. He left the scene. He had tried to charge him with, um, with this DUI, which would have been the second one for him. But the court system gave him a warning and called it a mistake because he's a white male in medicine. And that should have no bearing on anything. But in this situation, it did. So throughout all of this, I maxed out all financial resources that I had to protect my boys. I used credit cards, loans, um, inheritance um, from an insurance policy. Um, I used any and all means. Again, I sold everything. I went into such significant debt, like over a hundred thousand dollars just throughout the course of of all of it, everything that I had went into fighting this war and it was just battle after battle after battle. And you know, I, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't go back and stay because I wouldn't be here speaking my truth. I, I know that I would be dead and my boys would be worse for the wear. They are just as much in the middle of this as I am, you know, they are bruised and and bloodied and they've been through the ringer, their survivors too. 
and they've endured so much. And the piece for them is that they're still in that fire. They're still in it. Um, but I know that it would be a million times worse if they were in it a hundred percent of the time. I've been able to take them out of it close to 70% of the time and continuing to, to get them out of it a hundred percent of the time. So, you know, a few years ago, I started to unravel everything that I had been through and I realized that there was a name for it. I realized that this is narcissistic abuse, that this is domestic abuse. And I realized that I had endured emotional torture that I'd survived and that I had barely been able to get out and start to rebuild. Um, once there was a name for it, once I realized, you know, what this is, what I had endured in my childhood, what I had endured now with my ex-husband, and this was significantly worse than my childhood, um, I was able to educate myself. And I learned about the Gray Rock Method um, was one of my first introductions into kind of how to navigate some of the narcissistic abuse and try and keep yourself together um, a bit more mentally. So I started using this for about a year. Um, it made things significantly worse. But, and he, he just wanted a reaction. He didn't care, positive, negative, anything. And I just refused to give anything. I became essentially listless and boring. Um, and he was a master manipulator. Um, you know, he had done this and practiced this for almost 40 years. And, you know, in thinking about that, he had perfected this. You know, he had had to use these tactics during his own childhood to survive his own, you know, semblance of, of what he had to endure. So this is something that he didn't, he didn't even have to think about doing it. It's just how he operates. Um, but within this, I started to, you know, unearth cycles with him. So they were about every, every two weeks or so I'd have like the nice cycle and by nice, I don't mean, oh, he's being so nice to me. And I mean, bare minimum human, like not berating me, not sending me strings of aggressive text messages, not, you know, berating me at a drop off. That's what I mean by, by nice. Um, and then he'd be manipulative. And if that didn't work, then he'd be mean and rage at me. And it would just go on and on and on and on. He just wanted a reaction. He'd do this thing where during the court process with the guardian ad litem, he'd set up conversations to his favor. So he'd send a text message. And I'll be, I wouldn't communicate with him. I stopped communicating with him except in text message because I wanted it all documented. So I would not allow a phone call. Um, it all needed to be it's right there. And text message can be, you know, a little bit wonky, but I wanted it to just be very clear that like, this is what's being said because he was harassing me so much and just continuing all of this behavior. But he would take these screenshots of just partial conversations such as, oh, I want to take the kids to the pediatrician. He had never done this, but he would set it up as if I hadn't involved him in some sort of pediatrician appointment. Um, but he'd never taken any parental responsibilities, but now he thought, oh, okay, this is going to, you know, make me look good. He'd twist these truths until they no longer even resembled what had happened. He would ignore me at drop off. And then he would text me five minutes later as he's driving, you know, with the kids, or if he had just dropped them off to me and he'd just start berating me or you know, again, he'd want one of those screenshotable conversations. So he'd send me something like, oh, we should, you know, try to better co-parent for the sake of the boys after he's just been horrible at drop off or ignored me or, you know, whatever it was. But as all of this is kind of unfolding, I'm realizing his tactics are more and more obvious and it's becoming less clouded to me. So as I'm further removed from it, I'm starting to take my power back.
And so, you know, for a long period of time, he was able to maintain a level of functionality with the substance abuse piece too. You know, he's masking with the professionals. Um, And I do think that because of the level of mastery with his manipulation, you know, they do set themselves up and like their ego goes into overdrive. But for him, his use of substances hindered him because otherwise he may have had a shot at being successful and taking me down and carrying on with his abuse because he was able to mask so well and give the impression to the guardian litem, to the court professionals, um, that he was just this capable human being and um, described me as this crazy person. And in his corner, he has all of his family, right? And they're rallying and they're giving all of these stories and they're lying um, and giving, you know, false testimonies and all of these things. Uh, I want to talk about the guardian ad litem because this, this piece was, um, was pretty challenging as well, but she, this woman was biased before she even started the investigation. She was friends with my ex's lawyer, unknown until it was too late to change her from the case. The way that C and his lawyer interacted, I don't even know how the judges weren't like, okay, this really just needs to stop. Like, what is happening here? It was like very obvious, like like overly obvious. And I expressed concerns to my lawyer from the beginning that something felt very off and that she wasn't listening to me and that she couldn't hear me. So the GAL starting the item started and one week into the investigation, before she had reviewed any of the multiple child protective service reports that I had filed, we had had multiple investigations. She had met with my ex. She had had multiple conversations with his lawyer before I even spoke to her. And I only knew this because there's a shared document of charges and times. And she had interviewed all of his family. She said to me, there's nothing going on. When are you going to get that through your head? And she was raising her voice on the telephone with me as she's saying that to me. And, you know, I'm describing everything to her in terms of what happened. And she's asking me to recount it and recount it. And um, she told me that I was inconsistent. Um, and it, I was just re-traumatized through this whole process. You know, I'm recounting all of this abuse that I've never even talked about all of it in detail. And the only reason that I am is so that she understands how bad it was, how emergently I had to get the boys out of there and how unsafe it is for them to still be going in there until he gets some help. And I had filed to reopen the case because I wanted to afford him a way. I said, I am not, you know, I temporarily request full custody and he needs to get some help. And once he gets some help, then we can talk about where we go from here, but this is not safe. You know, that's the way that I came into this. And she said to me, it must be so hard to live in worst case scenario all the time. She wouldn't interview anyone that I had listed, my friends um, or any, you know, I had listed even my therapist because she knew everything that had happened for, you know, this time period. Um, She wouldn't interview them until two years later. It was literally indescribable, this process. She further gaslit me. It was literally now all of a sudden, he has a second lawyer. You know, she had when she finally did have her office reach out to, you know, two of the friends that I had listed that could give her a pretty clear testimony of, of a lot that had happened, including him threatening to kill me, like all of this stuff. Um, they left a voicemail on her, on one of my friend's phones. And it said, this is the guardian ad litem for my ex's name and his children. So it was just very clear that there was all of this bias. And I don't know if that's just, you know, her in terms of, you know, just like being a father's right, whatever. I don't know what it is, but it was horrible. I was given a total of four hours in this two-year investigation 
to recount what had happened and all of my, you know, concerns and what was going on. And it was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and hours and hours and hours that his lawyer and his family consumed um, time. It was just, it was such a horrible experience, which is why I, you know, talk about what I experienced through this. Um, it unleashed in me this strength that I didn't know I had, um, this tenacity, this, this endurance. And I decided, you know what? I control my life. I am going to control my life. I have endured this tremendous magnitude of pain and suffering, and that's going to be a catalyst. And I'm going to continue to heal. And I'm going to show my children unconditional love. And I'm also not going to call him my abuser. I'm not going to claim ownership of him. I'm not going to keep that connection with him or to him. He's an abuser. And I'm the person that he abused. And I'm not the last person he abused. I'm not the only person that he abused. I'm not going to know the full details of everything that my kids are enduring. Because they're also silenced. They're pressured to keep these secrets. Um, and for a long time they did, but they've reached a point now, you know, they're, they're breaking open and it had to come out because otherwise they're going to, they're going to explode. I sought counseling for my kids and my ex-husband refused to allow this. So I had to file another, um, case with child protective services and, um, because they were continuously coming home bruised, overly sexualized, trying to touch each other in, in very sexual ways, hungry, dirty, just neglected, all of these things. And um, they said to me, we can't put our finger on it. We don't, we don't have enough evidence. Um, one of the clinicians told me she sensed that something wasn't right, but she wouldn't be able to help. Um, the elementary school's guidance counselor told me that she couldn't offer any help. I have reached out to every single resource possible to try and help them. Yeah, you know, I talked to the principal because I felt like, okay, they're finally in elementary school setting. I'm able to, you know, find more resources now. And he said to me, the school has to stay neutral. So, you know, in all of this, it seemed like every door that I was trying to open just refused to open. They weren't, you know, it, there's a lack of education with these kinds of abuses. And it felt like, okay, it's not this glaring, you know, physicality here. Um, and so it's kind of too, you know, it's too messy. We can't, there's nothing that we can do is how it felt. So then they're charged with keeping secrets. You know, they don't, they don't know any different. The children don't. They're just, they're internalizing it. They're, th you know, and I know this from my own personal experience where you accept it as your normative. You accept this as this is what's happening. This must be what happens in a family dynamic. You know, this is how my daddy has always acted. So this is just what I endure. They don't know to go and say this and this and this and this and this and this. They don't know that it there's a name for it. They don't know that, you know, this is called abuse. And they're coming to me and telling me all of this, you know, and I'm seeking out, trying to seek out resources for them. But, we, you know, we were failed. We were failed by the court. We were failed by the police. We were failed by the school. We were failed by child services, failed by a guardian ad litem. Um, there was a psychological a forensic psychological evaluation as well which was um in depth but more kind of seeking out pathology and it was a questionnaire for substance abuse evaluation that was it and i said so that's going to be it for substance abuse how do you know that somebody is not abusing substances well he answered no on the questionnaire okay um so you know that's those are the barriers that, that I met through this. And so, you know, throughout all of that, we're just still living in that hell and struggling to hang on. So 
you know, part of the aftermath of everything is uh, taking care of your children. So when it comes to kids, you know, they're going to the home of the abuser and then they're coming back. So uh, we hear a lot that when that happens, you know, the kids come back uh, dysregulated. It takes a very long time for them to get regulated. And usually, you know, at a certain point, you know, once they get sent back to the other parent's home, they've only been regulated for a few days, maybe a couple days. So with you and your experience, how difficult was this for you? And what type of things did you have to deal with when your uh, children came back? Because this can also be very triggering for a, a parent who is trying to heal themselves, but also trying to take care of their children and uh, their needs and for them to be heard and to be allowed to be themselves. So, you know, you're, you're second on uh, the list here as far as caretaking. Um, so how did all of this affect you? Yeah, this was such, it is, it's such a hard place to navigate um, because it has a lot of layers. My boys um, are now almost eight and five and a half. You know, we've been going through this for for a long time. And as they have gotten older um, and bigger, it has gotten worse in terms of behavior. They come home very dysregulated and it takes a long time. It takes days to re-regulate. Um, it's almost like walking on eggshells. And that part is super triggering because you do that within these kind of relationships. So I did that for almost 40 years, period. Um, and so now in my own home, until I really learned how to navigate well, and, you know, it's it looks different every day. It's not the same every single day. And sometimes I struggle more than more than other days, but I try my best to navigate it with as much love as I possibly can give them because they are survivors too. And that's something that I really had to gain a really good clarity on is that they are survivors, but they are also still going through it. So they're victims and they're survivors. I mean, what a dichotomy and they're little kids, their brains are still developing. So it's just such a a mix of, and I don't know what it's going to look like day to day. So they come home and, and I have to help them re-regulate. They come home and they have to dump out everything that they've been holding in. They have all of these emotions and all of this baggage that they just have, they need me to take it for them. They need me to just be this emotional vacuum but then they also need to fill back up um, and they come home and they're so full of rage and they're so full of hate because they're being told all of these things and their minds are being manipulated and they're being gaslit and they're being coerced. And something that my ex-husband really gets off on is them um being told things and then taking it out on me. So, you know, he'll be in the beginning would say, you know, mommy took all of my things. Mommy's the worst mom. And he still says these things. Mommy's a horrible mother. Mommy's a bad mother. Um, mommy took the dog, like all of these things. So the kids are breeding and being taught like mom is not to be trusted. Mom's not a good person. Um, and, you know, they, I'm also the safe parent, right? So they're coming home and it's palpable when they come home. It's like this, like, like their bodies do this big sigh and they're like, okay. And they just need a minute to settle in. And then everything just comes up, up to the surface. And I remember what that feels like being little. Um, it's horrible. You're angry and you're sad. And I remember being really angry at my mom. And part of it was being angry that she was even sending us there and that we had to go there. Part of it was everything that I was hearing about her from my dad. Um, 
So one thing for me, and to this day, I have never said anything to my kids about him ever. I won't say anything. They say, daddy said this or, you know, oh, okay. Um, I won't because I will not add that to what they are already dealing with. I know that I took them out of that to, to support them and protect them. Even if they don't consciously know all of that, they do subconsciously. But part of what I've struggled with, with the behavior is that they mirror a lot of the abusive things that their dad would do and their behavior can be really abusive. And um, I realize that that's not a way that this is talked about a lot, but this is what's happening. Um, and I feel like if it's not talked about, then it just continues to happen. And I don't know, you know, if it's because if there's a sense of shame with it, there's sadness with it. It's a lot to endure as a mother to look at the behavior that your kids are doing and to stay like they're, you know, they're taking all of this out on me and I'm here to do that. I'm their safe parent. I'm their mother. I can take all of this on. But for me, you know, it includes being punched in the face and having my hair ripped out and they're spitting in my face and they're breaking my stuff. My five-year-old, if he gets really upset, he will go in his brother's room and just clothesline his bureau and all of his special things are just ripped off or he'll rip things up. He'll take stuff off the counter and rip it. He'll come in my room and destroy my plants. Um... My oldest will throw like big toys at me, like huck them at my head. And my oldest, who saw a lot of the, you know, of the abuse, my my little guy did too, but it, it's hard to appreciate how much he really processed of it. But my big guy will draw his fist back and punch it into my face like my like my ex. And that's very triggering. Uh, you know, when all of it started, right. Because there are escalation points with this piece too. And it's all in how I'm going to handle it too. So sometimes it looks different with when they come home. Sometimes it's, they need to, we need to just go outside and run around because there's all of this excessive energy. We need to come in and settle and just put on a program for 30 minutes and just kind of settle in. My little guy needs to rage out and be angry or my big guy needs space for a minute or they need to cry or my little guy is sitting on my lap and shaking and crying after he's just spent an hour beating on me and spitting in my face and it looks different and how I navigate it is allowing space also having to parent the behaviors that are dangerous and also sometimes sterner boundaries are necessary as well. So, I mean, it just, it looks different, but I have to keep in mind that they're survivors too. Sometimes I have to remind myself of that because it is really, really hard. And no matter the amount of healing that I have done throughout all of this, it still can trigger me at points. I've gotten a lot better at navigating it and being able to kind of know which way it's going to go more quickly than than others um but but it's triggering and you also have to balance it with basic parenting and basic consequences for certain behaviors but also being mindful of what they just endured the other piece of it is that they don't have healthy boundaries with their father so it's confusing when they come home. And I always say to them, we do the same things all the time so that nobody gets confused. We eat dinner around the same time. We're outside as much as possible. It's bath time every single night. because They don't get washed up at their father's. Um, you know, we've got to do the basic things to take care of our bodies. And so with these routines and kind of rules that we have, they sometimes many times will view that as mean because they don't have those basic boundaries where, you know, when they're with their father. So there's the confusion with that piece too. And then, you know, the other piece that I want to touch on for a sec 
um, is that they have to be able to dump out everything that they've been carrying. My youngest has had a lot of issues in school with his behavior because he's been bullying and kind of can be a little bit abusive with his hands to other students. And he's had to be talked to, you know, multiple times. He's learning that and he's seeing that um, with his father. And then he's emulating that, you know, he gets locked in his bedroom at his father's with the lights off when he's bad and he's told that he's bad often. And so I see my youngest becoming the scapegoat and my oldest is the golden child. He can do nothing wrong. And it's very likened to the dynamic that my ex has with his, with his mother as the golden child. And it's very, you know, likened to the dynamic where I was the scapegoat, not only in my family of origin, but then also in my ex-husband's um, family as well. So now my youngest is acting out and bullying and doing all of these things. So it's the piece of it is, you know, now my oldest is this extension of, of my ex and he talks a lot like him. He acts a lot like him. A lot of his mannerisms are the same. He emulates a lot of it, you know, and, and little boys, they want to, they want to be like their dad, right? They want to emulate that. That's somebody that they look up to, but what happens when it's somebody that's so dysregulated and unwell and abusive well, then, you know, I'm seeing these characteristics in both of my kids of some of these narcissistic traits. And I'm like, OK, great. Is this like, you know, is this them being primed to be abusers now? Are they primed to be abusees? It's just it's this big mess. So this is something that, you know, I'm actively dealing with to this day in this space. And um, just trying to counteract it with as much love and, and positive recentering as I can. So you are being the best mom you can possibly be. And you're taking care of them in every way. But for you, you're also coming out of this survival mode of being in this relationship and being in this war zone. So how are you doing and how has this process been for you? Um, you know, for me, it took me about four years to come out of survival mode and going through everything that I went through and surviving what I survived with my ex-husband. It made me, it made it no longer possible for me to not heal what I had been through in my childhood because it was a catalyst as well. And I am not saying that I am thankful for being abused. I am not sitting here saying, you know, that, that any of that was okay. But what I am saying is that through all of these very traumatic experiences that I survived, I have been able to be set on this healing journey. And it's taken me it took about four years. And over the past year, um, I would say I started to, you know, really heal. Um, and it took me a really long time. It was within the past year for me to verbalize out loud. Um, I am a survivor of domestic abuse in many forms. And to actually say that with you know, some power behind it. Like I am, I survived this. Um, and I took back the control in my life and I realized that I was still protecting the secrets of others that had chosen to abuse me, um, who had continued to abuse my children. And I realized the only way that this changes is if I speak about what's been happening and, and what we've been through and share you know, what we survived through. And for me, you know, I refuse to call myself a victim. My ex-husband is a victim. His mother is a victim. My mother was a victim. The abuses are the, are the victim. They're the victims of themselves. And they're always going to be that way because they refuse to change. But the other piece that I've had to, you know, come to realize too is it's a choice. They're not subconsciously doing this they choose to abuse. Um, 
and they choose it every single time they do it and they do it with intention. And if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening, what would they be? Um, you know, I would say, you know, these are parts of your story and, and there's not any shame with it. And it's not your fault. You were chosen because you are a, a good human. Um, and that scene, they gravitate towards towards good people because of your goodness and it's not your fault you deserve to be safe and and you're worthy of being safe well ellie i really want to thank you for being here today going through your trauma twice with me is not easy and you came in here today with a plan things you wanted people to learn experiences that you wanted to validate And you're a survivor who took their power back and you're an inspiration to everyone who is listening today, especially those who are still fighting just like you. So a really big thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Brandon. I'm I'm happy that I was able to share my story. Thank you. Well, Ellie, thank you once again. And if you want to be a guest like Ellie was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. At top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also at our website, we have our very own support group. So if you need support, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, press the support group button. There you'll see that we have our very own safe social network. And inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from other survivors and to give validation as well. It is a great group of people on there. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, Uh, You can go to DomesticShelters.org, and at DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you are dealing with. They have every phone number, email address, and web address for shelters and agencies. No matter how big or small your town is, DomesticShelters.org has it there and is a wonderful free resource, so please go to DomesticShelters.org if you need it. And that is it for today's story, for today's episode. So for myself and Ellie... We hope you have a good night.